suggests he may very well have been a pagan of the school of Damascus, writing as a Christian in order to preserve elements of, Christi or of paganism and, and uh, Neoplatonism with the impending doom of, of, of sort of paganism with the rise of Christianity and the Christian emperors. Um, and during Damascus, you will have the clones of the, the academy sort of fulfills this. And the evidence is interesting. It may or may not be conclusive, and that's entirely a different presentation. Um, <clears throat> so either a Christian monophysite uh, believes that you have Christ, who is God and is human, and that is a single essence as opposed to two essences, it will eventually become heresy, as all people think too. Or he was a pagan that somebody decided, because um, it's uh, Severus, who is a monophysite leader, who is the first person to even talk about the Pseudo-Dionysian corpus and identifies it as being monophysite in nature. <clears throat> so Dionysius, not actually Dionysius, the first century uh, saint who was converted by St. Paul, uh, he writes a number of treatises outlining creation's relationship with God. So he tries to describe nature, both mundane and metaphysical, um, and the nature of God, uh, the angel choirs, the, the sacraments, humanity, and pretty much everything else. He mentions everything from God to minerals at some point. Uh, so this chain goes from God to humanity, and then it goes back again, uh, which is a fairly platonic idea of, of secular procession and reversion. <coughs> Uh, it, cons it constitutes not only a hierarchical structure, but an ontological structure. Every level in the chain has a different amount of being, a different level of reality. So it, it is a very different type of thing from the level above it and the level below it. You have a transcendent God, which is the source of all being, and everything proceeds from and reverts to God so far as possible, a entirely common platonic phrase. And then outside of this divine cycle of abiding, proceeding, and reversion is evil, which has no being of its own. So we would, strictly speaking, say evil does not exist as a thing. And so what I'm going to attempt to explore is the nature of the Dionysian chain of being in terms of its Christian, if there are any, uh, and Neoplatonic heritages, uh, and its continuing relevance to modern liturgical practice, because that makes it interesting. So the Dionysian chain of being is some 14 links. Um, God isn't one of them. I've got him up there, but he's not actually attached to it. Um, and evil isn't one of those links. Uh, both of them exist if we can use the word exist. Um, they, they're outside of the system. Uh, what extends between these two are your, well, we've got your trinity and the incarnation, of course. You have your angelic choirs. Uh, we have the sacraments or the mysteries, um, as Dionysius usually calls them, uh, rational souls, human beings, uh, and then the sensible world has irrational souls, uh, non-human non -human animals, plant life, and, and mineral life. And then down here, evil. <clears throat> Angels and the sacraments are described primarily in the celestial hierarchy and the ecclesiastical hierarchy, which would be second 
two sets of books. There are four books and a bunch of letters. Um, God in singular, plural, and negative modes are discussed uh, primarily in the divine names, and then the, the mystical theology, which is his apophatic, his negative theology, where we try to say, well, God isn't any of those things. <clears throat> and then there are a bunch of letters, um, which are surprisingly relevant. Um, and if this is, in fact, a pagan forgery of a Christian, probably this is all that was ever written. If it's the actual writings from a Christian, then it becomes a question over whether there was more written, because he references several other books. Like, oh, and I explained this fully in my <coughs> own book, that nobody knows if it exists or not. So whether that's a blind or, or something else is sort of unknown. So if we're going to talk about ontology, we have to talk about this, this being thing. Uh, the divine names has what appears to be a, a somewhat rocky relationship with God. It, it, here God is described with increasingly contradictory language, which is so unusual. <clears throat> so we say that God is one, God is many, so that God is nothing, God is everything. The, the usual sort of going back and forth between opposites. Uh, the names of God are undifferentiated, but plural. The names of God are differentiated, but one. Uh, God has no name. These are all things that he talks about. <laughs> so, so pick one that you would like. So, so there's this inherent, inherent difficulty that God is, is something that is beyond comprehension, something beyond ineffability. And yet God is here. In everything, the root of everything, within everything, while not being any of those things at all. And this is pretty standard Platonism at this point. The gods sort of rain down their blessings, and they're in everything, and they affect everything, but those blessings are God, even if you added up all of those blessings, if you added up all of the signs and symbols of the gods, none of those things are actually the gods. <clears throat> Dionysius' understanding of God relies a lot on theology of late Plagan, the late pagan Neoplatonist Proclus, um, which, if you study Neoplatonism, Academically, usually you hear of Plotinus, Porphyry, we're going to skip the Amplicus, and then Proclus. Uh, in this, if you know me at all, you know this irritates me to no end, uh, but, but such is life. Um, but Proclus relies heavily on the Amplicus, so it's sort of this chain of, of succession, as it were. Though there's no direct lineage connection between the Amplicus and, and, and Proclus. This reliance is actually so heavy um, to the point where there are phrase, the, a lot of the phrasing, a lot of the use of stories that you see in uh, the Dionysian corpus are mimics of how Proclus writes, you know, including tonal phrases and things like that. It's like somebody looked at Proclus and just copied his writing style and did so using books that would not have been available to the public that they were only still within the academy, often only within uh, Damascus, who was the head of the academy at the time, his inner circle. So that is one of those kind of pluses for maybe it was a pagan. It doesn't cinch it, but it is highly persuasive to me, at least. Um, and so you do have this idea that maybe Dionysius was part of the Athenian academy. So it's not really surprising to find Dionysus' God modeled directly on the Neoplatonic one, uh, which is God. Um, especially found in what we call later Platonism, which is the Amblichus on onward. I don't know why that's later ne Neoplatonism, because it's only like the third generation of Neoplatonism, but there you go. Um, and so this is basically everything from the Amblichus to the close of the Academy in 529. Um, which is a year after the first reference to the Dionysian corpus is ever made. Uh, this is made by Severus, who's a monophysite Christian. Uh, the One is an utterly transcendent, utterly unknowable, non-being with a capital B, uh, a, a quotation here, super celestial and hidden deity uh, that is the source of all being. <coughs> the being is a somewhat important concept uh, in Hellenic philosophical thought. Uh, since at least 
Parmenides, who was one of Socrates' teachers, and there's a whole dialogue made for him. I won't tell you what it's called. Uh, Greek thought has uh, seen being as that which can be grasped by intellection. So you'll, you'll talk about the intelligibles and then the intellection that grasps the intelligibles above them. It's sort of the opposite of how we tend to think about things. We say we have a mind and it has processes and it creates these thoughts. And in Platonism, you've got the thoughts already existing, and then our mind reaches up to grasp them. And I like that. I don't know why, but I do. <clears throat> so on this idea of grasping the intellection, uh, Parmenides says, for you could not know that which is not, for it is impossible, nor express it. For the same thing is for thinking and for being. So that which cannot be thought of does not exist. That which can be thought of does exist. Not because I think it and it exists, but because it exists, because it has being, I can therefore think of it. The most ontologically superior beings, such as the gods in Iamblichian theology, are full of being. And that being is distributed ontologically uh, to ontologically posterior beings, everything that comes after the gods. Uh, this comes through what are called logi reason principles, from where we get logos from, same word, um, and the Platonic forms. They sort of ray down their, their being. And while we have our own being, we are often incomplete in, from where we come from, and so by participating through the logi, I think, through the forms, we sort of make ourselves what, we're, what we really are and what we've sort of forgotten. <clears throat> And so this becomes our, 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 our the, the nature, the essence of ontology here. We're trying to study what has being, how does it have being, where does that being come from? So being, then, is that which distinguishes one thing from another, genre-wise, typically. We have being and you have essence, which are two totally different but completely related ideas. Our being says we are humans. We are not vegetables, and we are not demons. Our being, well, except for Mark Thomas, of course. <laughs> I'm not going to say which way we're going to go, though. <laughs> now, with the exception of God and evil, where we have capital G and lowercase e, uh, everything that exists has being, uh, though not necessarily to the same extent. The seraphim, the highest of Dionysus' angelic choirs, have more being than a human, but both are very, very real. Just real in different ways. You and I, ontologically speaking, are real in exactly the same way, because we come from the same very, very low ontological level. <clears throat> so, God, non-being. I'm starting a little bit backwards it, usually when the Dionysian corpus, you see it in print, it starts with the divine names and then goes to the mystical theology. Um, the divine names, presumably, though I do not personally think so, talks about God as a cataphatic, as an existing thing, and I'm going to absolutely deny that it does so later on. Uh, and then celestial, or the mystical theology, talks about God as apathetic, as a non-existent, non-being a non-existent being that is also not non-existent. We'll get to that, because mm -hmm. it makes your head explode, and that's what's fun about point. And that's kind of the point. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so understanding God in the Dionysian Dionysi corpus is, as you've probably gathered by now, a little bit tricky. Uh, the God of the mystical theology is utterly transcendent. Again, this is very much like the first moment of Iamblichus's The One, what he calls the ineffable one, which exists within itself completely, extends in no way, shape, or form, and is utterly unknowable, beyond ineffability. It's a big, uh, I, I don't know, basically. That's a technical term. <coughs> the super essential nature of God is one of the most explicitly Neoplatonic elements of Dionysian theology. It is the first, maybe, quarter of Proclus's uh, elements of theology. Um, where he's just 
here is why there's this thing that we call God and it has no being whatsoever, but without it, there is nothing else. <coughs> um, and so it, this, this, this one, the good Dionysius usually calls it, is the foundation of all of this theology, much like the one is the foundation of theology within later Platonism. And Dionysius is, is quite explicit about God's not thisness, as I call it. God, as the preeminent cause of everything perceptible, is none of those perceptible things. Uh, and he, he says this quite, quite specifically in the mystical theology. He, God, and actually in the translation that I've been using, which is the John Parker translation, which is like from the 1920s, uh, is better than the, the translation that came out in late 1986, which uh, Parker describes as a paraphrase of Dionysius rather than a translation. So if you are familiar with the newer translation and wondering what the hell I'm talking about, that's why we're going to go with that as an explanation. So God's not perceptible, that either perceptible things, God is none of the intelligible things that it causes, and the Parker translation uses it with a capital I rather than he, and I like that. Uh, Dionysus doesn't really explicitly talk about the soul, talks about people instead. And they're not exactly the same in Platonic thought, but they're close enough. Um, so presumably, even though he doesn't say anything about it, um, God is not any of the souls that God causes, and so forth. God's nothingness is absolute, so much so that the language we use to describe God's nothingness messes with us. We'll say, well, God is beyond being, so we think about a being that's beyond being. Or, we say, God is beyond thought, so we try to think of something that is beyond thought. And we say, oh, well, it's that. It's like when we talk about God being all good and all knowing and all powerful, we take our regular concepts of goodness and knowing and, and powerful, we just tack this all onto the end of it, and we pretend that we've come to something new when we really haven't. We've just sort of blown up. We've just made a really big, awesome person, as opposed to one of us or my house. <coughs> now, but in what appears to be an allusion to Parmenides, uh, Dionysius writes, for if all kinds of knowledge are of things existing and are limited to things existing, that beyond all being is also elevated above all knowledge. So that if God is beyond being, we can know nothing about God. Because something, we can only grasp with our minds something that has being. That, that close connection between thought and being. And God has none of that. As Parmenides says, we cannot have knowledge of something that is not. God is just beyond. God is nothing. Any statement, positive or negative, about we make about God isn't about God. We can't say God exists. At the same time, we cannot say God does not exist because those both have the quality of existence to them. God is beyond existing and non-existing altogether. <coughs> uh, so to quote Plotinus, which I'm often loath to do, but occasionally he gets it there. This phrase, beyond being, does not mean that it is a particular thing, for it makes no positive statement about it. And it does not say its name, but all it implies is that it is not this. So whatever you're talking about, God's not that. Not only can, must we say, God is not this, but we also then have to say, God is not, not this. Because by saying, God is not this, we are making a statement about God. And we must negate it. This is part of what makes pseudonymous make your head explode. <coughs> and... Moreover, beyond being does not refer to something with infinite being, which is a, a frequent concept. Well, it's beyond being, so this must be infinite. And that doesn't work in, in, in Platonism, especially not in Neoplatonism. Uh, in, in Neoplatonic thought, something that is limited and definable is superior to that which is infinite and undefinable, which is sort of the opposite if you're familiar with uh, like Kabbalah where we talk about the coolest things are the infinite stuff. Well here, no, that's not, that's not very good. 
So to say in Platonism that God is infinite, that would not really be, ooh, a good thing. It's like, well, then, whatever. Now, moreover, again, being is defined by limitation, because being separates one genre of things from another genre of things. <coughs> infinite being is therefore basically a contradiction in terms. You can't have, be infinitely this. You're this, and you are not anything else. And God is neither limited nor unlimited, but is outside the concept of limitation altogether. Instead, the one, the good, is kind of like, though not exactly, like the Pythagorean monad. In Pythagoreanism, one, two, three are not numbers, but sort of realities. Um, and the monad is neither finite nor infinite. It's not odd or even, even though we mark it as, a, as the number one. Uh, it's in traditional Pythagoreanism, especially in the Neo-Pythagoreanism that you see in Neoplatonism, so you have Pythagoreanizing Neoplatonists, which is an awesome thing to say. Uh, the, uh, the monad is not a number, because number implies distinction. If you have one, therefore there is something other than one. Uh, and the monad comes before all that. Numbers in, in Pythagoreanism start at the, the, the duad, dyad. Diet. Um, and you get true difference starting with the, with, with the triad, which differentiates between your odd and your even, um, and that sort of fun stuff. <clears throat> so, in get, so instead, again, quoted Plotinus, the one is not anything, but before each and everything, and is not a being. For being has a kind of shape of being, but that has no shape, not even intelligible shape. For since the nature of the one is generative of all things, it is none of them. And this again is part of a fairly traditional Platonic thought. That which produces or emanates something is not that thing. And doesn't even necessarily have the qualities of those things. You will, will read um, Proclus or Amplus talking about um, ethics and morality. And say, well, the gods have no ethics, or virtues. The gods have no virtues because they're beyond the need for virtue. The virtues come from them, or from their forms. And so, as you take this upward, eventually you get to God, from which everything comes from, but it has nothing at all in common with those things. It doesn't have goodness in it. It's really beyond that. It doesn't have love in it. It's beyond that. At the same time, it is the source of goodness. It is the source of love. <coughs> Also, feel free to ask questions at, at any time. Yes, could you start on? <laughs> In the late fifth or early sixth. <laughs> Why, yes. <laughs> Perhaps when you get to a topic that's more within the realm of human comprehensibility, there may be more questions. Yeah, well, well we will get to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you have to start at nothing before you can get to something. I love this as a visual aid as well. <laughs> <laughs> because it's non being, so I put him way up here. Yeah, I wanted a filler. Here's, here's what God's like. Nothing. I, actually, if I could just. Um, I mean, this sounds like it's drawing so much from the description of the form of the good in, in say, Book 7 of Republic. Mm -hmm. Where, where we're explicitly told that the good is beyond being in all of its qualities, yes. uh, and it is on the basis of the good that differentiation happens. Yes. Um, so this is just, I mean, this is really just a golden thread. It, yeah, right? I mean, the, the, the Neoplatonists, Plotinus somewhat, his, his understanding of the one is both in some places is and is not at the same time. Um, but once you get to the later Neoplatonists, it seems pretty clear they are explicitly trying to understand this good beyond beings, good beyond form. Um, and it makes a, a, well, obviously quite complex sort of theology trying to understand. Uh, yeah, I, and I wonder if sort of philosophically you can draw that thread forward to people like Levinas, who <coughs> takes up explicitly this idea of, of the good beyond being as an ethical principle. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, 
um, before you get out of the high theory, would you care to comment on the maybe rather obvious fact that this could be grafted onto some versions of Taoism without too much damage? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. I, anytime you start dealing with these ideas of, I think the Tao is a really good example uh, because we, and I, and I try to teach this fairly regularly with, with world religion class, and I talk about the Tao, it's a god, right? No, no. But well, what is it? Well, read the Tao Te Ching. <laughs> it's not really going to tell you what it is, but that's kind of the point. <clears throat> because it's the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao, you know. Um, and that's very similar to, to the ineffable one. <clears throat> and we're going to get a little more picky, because the Amalgus especially has different versions of the one depending on how we view it. And we'll get into that a little bit. One last footnote. Now, is it or is it not true that you have been known to, you, Mr. Kupperman, did at one occasion F the ineffable one? I neither <laughs> confirm nor deny <laughs> the effability of my effort. And if I could just uh, fix that in post. <laughs> <laughs> throw one more uh, sort of spanner into this. Um, what do you think of the uh, idea that I think has been fairly recently put forward that uh, identifies uh, Dionysius with um, Peter the Igeria. I have not heard that. Okay. So I have nothing to say. Uh, at some point, I want to do something on this idea of who Dionysius was. I want to go through, really go through the Proclus's. Uh, Platonic theology, where a little lot of this comes almost directly out of, mm -hmm. and see what happens if we take out all of the Platonic theology and see what's left. Yeah. If there's anything there of substance, or if it's just a bunch of quotations from the Bible that, without the substance, mean nothing. <laughs> but that's another paper. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I have not. I have not heard that yet, so. yeah, anything else before I attempt to find where I am? Just the capital I for it. Um, yes. That, yeah, I noticed that because I have that edition that I was. I think it I, there are a couple of them now. Yeah. 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 Um, is that actual? Do you think that that's? I have no idea. My Greek is pretty much non-existent, um, except for like the technical terms. Uh -huh. um, so I really don't know what Dionysius actually uses in in his writing. Yeah, and I don't know if that's something that Parker just decided to do because you're trying to talk about something that is beyond talking about, and so it seems to make a little more sense than that he, or if that's inherent to Dionysius, I, I simply have no idea. Um, in <coughs> Neoplatonic writing, one rarely, if ever, sees the one referred to gender. So it, so it might be quite legitimate. <coughs> Anything else? Okay. Now, Dionysus' apathetic theology is not just a linguistic theory. It's not just, because the Parmenides, in their original context, in, in the dialogues, they are a series of hypotheses that are not necessarily supposed to be reflecting reality. And the Neoplatonists take them as ontology. This is what reality is actually like. <coughs> um, and Dionysius, being a Neoplatonist, is going along with that. So this is not just us talking about.